Yep. Up we go, up we go, good morning, good morning. <coughs> Start with a different scene here today. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> Let's put up some other cameras. We've got the uh, outside camera. Like it's, a, it's a hazy, hazy, hazy day here in Asakusa today. Hazy, crazy day. It's Saturday. It's going to be very busy here in Asakusa. Not busy in my shop, but busy outside. It's going to be muggy. It's going to be hot and later in the afternoon rainy. A classic summer weather. Muggy and warm during the day. It'll be sweaty during the day. And then it's going to be raining this afternoon. Same thing for tomorrow. Classic uh, rainy season slash summer weather. What have we got left out there? Is that a, looks like a tea. <laughs> no big deal. Was it last week? There was a bunch of broken bottles out there. I had to clean them up. Today, just a cup of tea, no problem. You know where we are. You know the plan today. We're carving, we're picking up, I can't say we pick up where we left off because the last couple of days I have done a lot of work. I spent all day yesterday at the bench here. I think when I left you on Thursday morning, Wednesday night for you, we had just started to carve the first one here. I finished it off later that day, yesterday, moved over to the other one, did this and cleared out the open ones. I thought I'd save this one for the end. Coming along well. It's rainy day today, so I'll be finished this block today. We'll move on to the next block, and when you see me again a couple of days from now, we'll be carving the second key block down in this area of the, of the wood. So progress, progress, progress. It's looking nice. This wood is so much fun. It's not the hardest box what I've ever had, but it's, uh, it's nice. The grain is so smooth and clean. We've mentioned before, it's like cutting butter, but hard, hard butter. If you imagine butter, but super firm. You know the feeling when, when, when you use sliced cheese or butter, when it's a nice, you know, firm consistency, you gotta slice, slice. Imagine butter, but being really quite hard, but still having that total smooth smoothness for cutting. I don't know, I've never cut frozen butter. I don't know. I'm just trying to describe what it's like with this wood. It's completely smooth. And you want to say it cuts like butter, but it's not, you know, melted stuff, you know. Okay, let's get the camera positioned here. I'll be starting somewhere around there. Should I maybe make the other cameras a bit smaller? Can I? Paper is not out. There's nobody here today, and nor is there anybody going to be here tomorrow. There's two days with no printers here. We are so lazy. Lazy, we're not. Simply, they've been working the last few days. They've sort of done a normal, a normal system. They've worked weekdays, and they're off for the weekends. They choose their own time. Eh? I don't tell them when to come or anything like this. They completely choose their own times. And the current weekend, they're off today and tomorrow, unless I get a phone call saying, uh, saying we're going to be coming. So no paper out. I didn't discover that. I set my alarm at 6 o'clock, dragged myself away, got to go up at 6 to get the paper out. I get up to the stairs there, my shorts and whatever, I look at the fridge door, freezer door, and there's no buttons for today. So back to bed, set the alarm for another hour. <laughs> I got an extra hour of sleep today. So. Okay, let's get busy. I sharpened a couple of times yesterday while I was doing this. This boxwood needs sharpening, absolutely. You can see the thing, hollow ground on the back. You can see the little bevel at the edge. You can see it there along the, along the edge. There's something that's shining there along the edge. And that's a bevel on the back side of the blade. In a, there it is, you can see it there. There's a bevel on the back side of the blade in addition to the main bevel on the front of the blade. And you can also now see the file marks where I have used to file to thin down this blade. When I got it, I found it was too 
fat. It was too fat, this. It's hard steel on the cutting surface and soft steel on the top, and it was just too fat. So I grabbed a file and filed off some of the top surface. That's so that when we put it on the sharpening stone, that steel is not in the way. I can hold it at a low angle and cut and sharpen it. There we go. Oh, Taran-san is here this morning. Taran-san is waiting for me again. <laughs> Sorry, sir. <laughs> I gotta get things balanced. You know, Taran-san is waiting for the next job, and he's a bit frustrated. I said a week ago or so I'd get it to him real soon now, and I haven't done that yet. So, Taran-san, I'm sorry. I'll try and get to it. It's you know what's going on, balancing the different jobs. I'm, I apologize. I apologize. Let's do some work. Talansan, I don't know if you saw what we were doing here. This job came onto my desk last week, and it's a bit of an unusual job in that for the key lines, every single line on this key block is straight line. There are no curves. Everything that looks like it might be curved here is actually segmented. One, two, three segments. One, two, three, four, five. I created this by going, taking Jed's image in Photoshop and tracing over it by using the, the pencil tool and clicking. Click and drag, click, click, click. So I didn't do any drawing with the tool, I just clicked to jump. You know how you do it. You hold the shift key down, click, shift key, click, shift key, click, and it draws your segments. So every single line here is straight. This is the kind of job we should give to a beginner. Can we get this in a bit more? I'm not sure. Now, for those of you who weren't here the other day, I've got the image of this thing, Sh supposed to show it or not. This is the concept. This is a Photoshop mock-up. And the idea is we're going to have five prints in a row. There's two more, one on each side. And it's a mock-up of an Aomori Nebuta float, of course. So for the outlines, the, the real floats are made with sticks of bamboo and stuff. I'm using boxwood, and as we mentioned the other day, it's not that this print is so delicate that it needs boxwood for this. If I had a good piece of cherry, we could have used cherry for this, no problem. Just recently, I don't have any kind of good stable cherry pieces. I mean, as it happens, we do have a bunch of boxwood on hand, partly preparing for next year's series. So boxwood it is, but uh, this really doesn't demand boxwood. There's our sound. We haven't heard this sound for years. Look at this. Oh, they're not tourists, they're cosplayers. Okay, let's <laughs> see. The 
that sound of the wheels running down the street. It used to be a constant background sound for us. You know? I guess maybe it will be again. But, uh, it's now been taken over by cosplayers. Looking good, sharp and clear. No, someone's asking about the wood. The key block here will be boxwood. The color blocks will be cherry, absolutely. We don't have to have the same kind of wood exactly all the way through. Different wood would be a problem if it wasn't laminated stuff. If we're using raw wood, then yes, absolutely. You wouldn't mix and match, nor would you mix and match grain direction. But because we're using laminates here, because we're using plywood, we get very little swelling and shrinkage, so it doesn't matter what kind of wood we use. Someone's asking, reprinting the Great Wave soon. Another batch is happening upstairs this week. Sugisan has already started. Paper is moistened yesterday. She moistened the paper yesterday for her next batch of waves. So another 60 sheets are coming in another 10 days, two weeks. More waves are coming. More waves, a wave of waves. The blocks are still doing very, very well. Sugisan, uh, I, I think I can say this without uh, being disrespectful to her. She, she had 60 sheets in her last batch, which was the first group she's done of this wave. And she didn't get 60 finished ones because uh, the block set was strange to her. She had to experiment a bit. She had to figure out, go back and test, decide what to do. So she didn't get 60 sheets out of it. I don't need to say how many, it doesn't matter. But this time she's determined to get uh, as nearly 60 sheets as possible. When we send the paper to Chihara-san, because she's got lots of experience with this, she's done it many times over the years, she gets nearly 60, it'll be 56, 58, something like that. But uh, Sugisan didn't get that for her first batch, understandably, but uh, she is now determined, with experience now, to increase her count on this. That suits me fine too, because if I give her 60 sheets of paper, the ideal is to sell 60 prints, of course. So.
Okay, something we have to do today, uh, the other one, when I was carving this on Thursday stream, I was cutting in the middle here, and we didn't get to the border. And it was after the stream was over, I cut the borders. And then later that day, cut this one, yesterday cut this one, cut this one. So you haven't seen any border cutting. So let's do that now before I forget. Because people are always asking about this, the ruler and the border and everything else. And I'm going to just do a quick and easy one here. I'm going to use the same knife. Let's get this. If I turn the angle a bit so you can perhaps see it better in the camera. Let me try and figure out how to do this with good visibility. I'm going to use a super thin little ruler. Normally we'd use a quite heavy ruler, sometimes one even with a bevel undercut so the blade doesn't touch the ruler. But I'm going to use a super thin little ruler here. I'm going to try and get it inside so that the ruler is covering up, not the line, but the ruler is covering up the waste wood. And I'm not going to cut a line here, I'm going to scratch a line. Can we do this? Just going to scratch all the way down. I'm being careful, the, the, the blade, my cutting knife actually is touching a metal ruler. So if I angled it a bit too much, the, the blade would be damaged by the ruler. But I'm just sliding along the edge. And we've, we've just done all, what's the word? We've, uh, we haven't cut any wood. We've just, just scraped a line, scratched. We've just scratched it. And we've also cut straight through. So we've gone through some lines here. And if I had cut too deeply, of course, we'd be cutting this line. But it's just a scratch at this point. see the lines, now we can cut, quote, freehand. It's not just, I mean, I can see the line before because the black was there, but now it's scratched. And my knife now, if I put it in here, my knife will follow that scratch. Lighten up, push down. up to the line, slide across, push down. Oh, here's our hair. This looks like a broken block. This is our hair that we pasted on the other day. This is the last remnant of the hair.
I'm good. I am cutting through the lines that touch the edges very lightly. It's more important to keep this line one piece. If I went like this, if I cut down here, across, back, down, across, back, down, we'd never get the feeling of a straight line here. So any time in the picture where lines cross like this, same thing here. When it comes time to cut this, we can go right through. Well, this one's, a, this one's not straight, so let's find one where it's straight here. Same thing here. Whenever we have a T, we go right through the top of the T, but we don't cut deeply. I'm, I'm lifting the knife up here and going through, so it's just a scratch. So when it comes time to cut the, the other part of the T, I can plunge here. Pop out the triangle, which might not pop out because it's not cut deeply there, and then pop it out and we're away. So there is an actual tiny scratch across the top of this. Doesn't matter, pigment will never ever ever know about that. Okay, let's clear some of this. And the normal way for this to happen in the traditional way now is the knife would go over the whole thing and then we clear the open spaces. But I want to do it bit by bit by bit so you can see the different parts of the procedure. So this section now, this hair section, is now cut and let's clear it. sound you're hearing in the background it's scaffolding somebody is putting up scaffolding somewhere it may be the building under construction behind us it may be something else I don't know I don't recognize the direction of the sound here Deliveries, deliveries. So I was asking, what motives do I like carving most? I know there's two ways to think about this. I know you're talking about motifs, what patterns or whatever. The the professional carver's approach to this, the traditional classical Japanese shokunin, and we've talked about this in the videos, is he doesn't care. It's nothing to him. Give me the work, I'll carve it. He doesn't have, we, we, we say in Japanese, ski kirai ga nai desu. Ski, we like something, kirai, we don't so like something. A craftsman would never express any preference for this. My job is to carve lines, I'll just carve the lines. The human beings are human beings, and I guess some are more attractive than others, but the shokunin, the craftsman, is trying to erase that. Again, we've talked about the same topic many times. I think the example that always comes to mind, Dave, when you hit, hit me with the same story, the, the hotel guy, and this is a true story, it goes back to a guy I met years and years ago, when we, this conversation came up, but he was a, a chef, a patissier or something, who worked in a hotel. He had to make cakes and desserts, and he couldn't stand strawberries. This guy just couldn't bear the thought of strawberries, but he had to make strawberry cakes and stuff, and that's the point. You can't let your own 
desires and preferences get in the way. Do your job as well as you can. Having said that, I am not 100% total Japanese craftsman. I'm a guy who's doing this for fun. So yeah, yeah, of course, this one for me is really, really fun for reasons that are sort of perhaps obvious. <laughs> so yes, I do like it, you know. Is my mother getting along well in her new place? She is settling in bit by bit by bit. I had a Skype chat with my, my daughter a few minutes before the stream started. They sent me some pictures of mom. They were in the, uh, they took the park the other day. They're in Nelson Park and today they're visiting somewhere. And it seems mom's having fun. It's a different kind of life, of course. She's lost a lot of her independence, which is not happy for her. She, she doesn't feel happy in the place she is. But in real life, actually, it's just exactly the same life that she had before. She's got a room of her own. She sits there quietly most of the time, watches a bit of TV, goes to the park, feeds the birds. This is the kind of stuff she was doing sort of before. And my family is there, my brother's there with her, my sister's there with her. So life for mom is sort of exactly the same, except the feeling that you've lost control. It's not, you know, her own independence meal times are set and the, the, the choice of meals are set and stuff like that. So in that sense she's not sort of happy but she has to understand that at 95 years old she's just no longer able to completely take care of herself. So, uh, so be it. But yeah she's getting along, getting along. She's still having trouble with the motor control so she can't grab a mouse and go and click something which is why she's not participating in these Twitch streams. She can't actually do that sort of thing anymore easily. And this is too bad because it has very much uh, closed her life in. She used to feel really a part of this community, being able to type stuff and say, hello fish and, and stuff like this, you know. And she can't, her motor control doesn't allow her to do that anymore. So, uh, so that is a sad part of her life. But she's hanging in. She's hanging in, doing lots of different stuff. Well, we haven't taken her in, you know, that, that would be sort of the, the ultimate way that everybody would like this to happen. My mother's living in a home, a nursing home. Uh, my brother is uh, three blocks away in my mother's old place, and then my sister is three blocks away in a different direction in her home. So my mother is surrounded by family, but she's, got, uh, she's not living at home. Mm -hmm. It's turned out pretty good. It could have been a whole bunch worse. You know, we were able to get a placement in the, in the Vancouver system, the BC system, in a wonderful, wonderful place, in a wonderful, wonderful location. So the, the system over there, to speak of it monolithically, it really, really, you know, is performing well for us. You know. My mother paid all her life. She paid into the insurances and the, and the health and everything else. And uh, now she's getting benefit. But uh, but yes, the system over there is, is glorious, absolutely wonderful. And a normal middle class family like ours can uh, can take care of an aged parent like this without losing without losing her home, without having. Tons of, of savings. It's a wonderful, wonderful system.
These prints, this print will not be singly available. This is part of our subscription series. This is this will be part of the August print of our current year's subscription series. So you can't ever buy just this one, but uh, that's what they are. So. <clears throat> and we are now actually demand for this series has been so steady and so strong. We have now started. In fact, it started yesterday. The blocks for the set print number one and two. The blocks for one and two together, they went out to Chiharu-san. And over this next couple of weeks, she, we're going to start a reprinting. We're reprinting a hundred more sets of each one of January, February, March, whatever print. So starting soon, this series is going to open for subscriptions again, and we will have room for a hundred new subscribers. So it's going to be going on. It's going to be continuing. Obviously, this when I, when I set this series up, last year, I really wasn't 100% sure would people really be interested in such small prints. I was afraid people would find them trivial. And that even though we make them carefully and we make them with good skill and they look beautiful, the fact that they are so small, I was really afraid people would find the whole concept to be too trivial. And certainly in Japan that's been the case. Other craftsmen who have seen this because they know that in the old days, match label prints and senshafta prints were trivial junk work, we're getting no respect for this locally at all. My landlady, whose grandfather ran a workshop that made match label prints, bang, bang, blow them out, bang, bang, blow them out, she thinks we're just making junk because she hasn't actually sat down and seen one of these. She doesn't realize. She has the mindset still from like 50, 60 years ago when prints, small prints like this, were completely trivial junk, you know. So I was afraid that that would, that would be the mood, you know, why are you making such small little junk, Dave? And yet, I thought that if we used our full resources, capable of making beautiful woodblock prints, that the actual size wouldn't matter. In fact, that's what the whole series is about. Embrace the delight. They can be delightful and attractive. And they don't have to be wall size. And there's lots of people out there that do seem to be uh, on board with this. And they, we're, we're sold out still. But there is a tradition of miniatures in many parts of the world, a different art. I think Persian art miniatures are a real big deal in the, the world of fine art. So being small is not a, a it's not an indication that it's junk, you know. Straight lines, it's all straight lines. So this one, you know, the finished result here will have absolutely no character from the carver. When you see this at the end, you, will you be able to say, was this carved by Dave or was this carved by Taran-san or Chon-san or Asuka-sensei? It will look exactly the same. There will be no carver's touch whatsoever on this one because it's really, really mechanical. And if all of our work were like this, if it was all mechanical, this, this job would be a whole lot less interesting. I don't mind doing this once. This is actually fun to do this as a, as a, as a sort of break from the normal carving. But if all of our work was like this, my God, it would be no fun whatsoever. Just turn it over to the machines. Who cares? You know? No human touch whatsoever.
Ho, 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 ho. Talking about magnification, there isn't much magnification going on here. I'm doing it through a microscope because I need help. I do need you know, a lens correction. But we've got a special lens put at the bottom of the scope here. And it's a lens that cuts the magnification. This is not five times, this is 0.5. So the normal lens on the back bottom of this microscope would increase, increase, increase. But we have a reducing lens, is that what it's called? At the bottom of this, to make the field of view wider and make the object smaller. So I'm not actually seeing it through the lens much different than what you see on the screen here. We'll do this later. I think you know, that we've sort of got a date, John and I. John, John's off today. John, one of the mods, is not here today. He's got a networking uh, thing, I think, going on today. But he's big into cameras and lenses and stuff. And I think we've got sort of a, a semi uh, date set up here that next time he's over in Japan, he's going to give me a hand. And we have a setup here. I have a camera that looks down through the microscope. And I tried to set it up before, but I had lots of trouble with light levels and focusing and uh, frame rates and stuff. So I just put it aside. So, but it's on the, the menu that when I get time for it, and John and I are gonna make time for it, we will try setting that up again next time he's in Japan. So there will be some future streams. If we can make it work, there will be some future streams where your view is looking down through the microscope because we will have a third I have a trinocular microscope as well here in, in Asakusa. And we will try and get it working with a camera looking down through so you see exactly what I see. So just stay patient. One day we'll get that up and running. There's another reason why I haven't worked on that specifically in that that microscope, the trinocular one, because of the, the physics of the lens and the optics, we can't get the lens quite so close to the work as this. So the trinocular microscope that I've got, I can't sit like this. I have to get a cushion and I have to sit up like this so that the eyepieces end up sitting about this high. So it's much more, well, it's not more difficult. It's a bit strange for me to sit way up and be looking down, which is why at the moment I've switched back to this one because it's far more comfortable for me to sit here. It replicates pretty much exactly what I would be holding my body if I were just carving with no scope. But the trinocular demands some body contortions. Here's our vacuum cleaner from the hotel. We had interesting things happening at the hotel yesterday, the last two days. There's been an interesting kind of maintenance work going on at the hotel. And uh, the first time it happened, it was on Thursday, I guess, two days ago. I was sitting here working on this block, carving this, and there was a strange noise coming from across the street. And the best way to describe it if you imagine somebody, you're out on the street, 
and somebody, you hear a sound coming from behind you. And it sounds like somebody holding a stick and scraping it back and forth across the sidewalk. And you turn around and you see, oh yes, it's a white cane. Somebody is blind and they've got one of those sticks and they scrape across the sidewalk feeling for bumps and stuff like this. Well, this sound was coming. I sat here carving and the sound was coming from outside and there were two of them and it was scrape, 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 scrape. Two of them at the same time overlapping. Two people were doing this and then it was, they would change the scrape, scrape, scrape and it changed to tap, 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 tap. And this went on, and I'm sitting here carving, thinking, what is that? What are those people doing? I, f I first thought it was, you know, a blind person or a sight deficient person walking down the street. Can you tell me, before I tell you what it was, I've, I've already given a hint because I said it was, it was relevant to the hotel, what was that sound? Because finally, I just couldn't stand it anymore. I went outside and looked and realized, ah, now I get it. So if you imagine that sound that I've described, that scraping, 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 two people doing it, not in synchronization, and then tapping, what were they doing? <laughs> Let's, I'll give you a minute to do the same thing that I did on Thursday, to sit here and think, what on earth are those people doing? They didn't finish on Thursday. They came back yesterday. What were they doing? Somebody's got some guesses. Cleaning windows, no. Redoing the window caulking, no. Scraping gum, no. Collecting litter with metal picking sticks, no. Prospecting for gems, cleaning windows, curling, looking for treasure, laying bricks, no. Flattening cement, no. Scraping paint, no. I wish I could imitate the sound. I can't. It's sort of a sweep, 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 scraping across the ground and then alternating with tapping, tapping, tapping. What they were doing, let me pop up the outside camera here, just a bit larger, just for a moment. They were working on the hotel across the street, and there were two guys, and they were hanging on ropes from the upstairs, from the roof. So there were two guys, like, like window cleaners do, and they were in little rope chairs. Now look at the hotel there, I don't know if you can see it. It looks like a sort of a dark gray surface. The hotel over there is actually surfaced with tiles. It's some kind of tiles. I think that the tiles each look about this big and I think they had them in sheets and they glued them up on the surface of the hotel when they built it or whatever. 
And these guys were using these metal rods and they were running across the surface of the tiles, up and down, up and down, listening to the sounds. And they were listening for the sound where there was a tile that wasn't bonded properly and that it was hollow underneath. That's why they were scrape, scrape, they'd hear something, then they tap, 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 tap. And the guys, each of them had a big clipboard with, with a design, and they tap and tap and tap. That one sounds like it's hollow, it's not bonded. They took their clipboard and they did some marking. Maybe they marked, that tile looks dangerous. Next earthquake, it's gonna fall off or something. I'm curious now what happens next. I think there they went down halfway Thursday, then halfway Friday. There was men at the bottom guarding so that if you tapped and a tile fell off, it wouldn't hit on somebody's head. And they covered, as far as I could tell, the whole surface of this hotel, scraping, 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 tap, 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 scraping, tap, tap, and they went back over each other's territory. So everyone was covered twice. And I guess this is required by law, or this is common sense maintenance, or maybe somewhere one little tile did fall down, and now they're up there trying to check this so that you don't kill anybody with falling tiles. I have no idea. I've never seen this before. And is this a thing in other places? I don't know. That hotel was built the year before we came. We came here in 2014, so it was built in 2013. To maybe 2012, so maybe it's 10 years. Maybe the building has been there nine or 10 years. And they were clearly checking to see the bonding condition of the tiles. Were the tiles strongly bonded to the, to the surface or was there risk of them falling? But if I played you that sound without any background information, you would never, ever, ever in a bajillion years. And I didn't get it. I had no clue. I eventually gave up. I just put my knife down, went outside. What is going on? <laughs> so, because I didn't get it. But once you see it, of course, aha, now I get it. Now I get it. What's your job, Daddy? What do you do? I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, how would I describe my job? I'm a tile bonding checker. I hang in the air from the 35th floor of a skyscraper, tapping the wall to make sure the tiles are bonded. I do this every day. Is it a job? Is it a real thing? Or was this something that company just got called in to do as a special case one-off or are there people for whom this is their job hi there mr. Smith I'm a woodblock printmaker what do you do what would he what would he be called I'm a tile bonding checker I don't know no idea tile inspector that sounds better I'm a tile inspector there's a vegetable man. Yes, 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 yes. There is our vegetable man. The part we can read at the moment, it's on the door. It says yasai, vegetables. Yasai no something. What's hidden? Well, this is nice. Somebody's had a thought. Would the tapping make the tile unfix? And as soon as I, I stood there watching them, I thought, wait a minute. Wait a minute. It says yasai no... Uh, maru yasu. Maru yasu. So I thought this. What they're doing actually, they're going to weaken all these things. The next earthquake comes, the whole thing's going to cas cascade down. Are they weakening the tiles? I guess, whatever, they had very light little wands, light little sticks. They weren't smacking away with a hammer. This was not persuader work. This was, you know, this was very light. And I guess... I guess this is a thing, you know. I mean, there must be people out here that know more about this. Yes. Yasai no maru yasu. Rope access technician. <laughs> this is cool. <laughs> I'm going to get a message coming in the background through Skype here from my daughter.
whatever, whatever, whatever. We'll see. Tile matchmaker. <laughs> so, so. Well, they're doing it by sound. Clearly, they were doing it by sound. Absolutely. They were listening for hollow, hollow sounds, you know. So I guess, sure, they weren't trying to knock any tiles down. I'm sure it was all done by sound. So. All right, coming along. You can see how this is going, you know. There's nobody visiting here today, so clearly after the stream's over, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to get this thing finished today. We're going to get this. We're moving along, moving along. thing I do that is absolutely different from the traditional guys is, is that I do this zone by zone like you can see what I did I did the hair area first then I did the background then some more background there's no way the traditional guys did this they just started in the middle of an area of a block and then for the most part they would just start in the middle and then just go around and around and around and around and around until all the lines were cut you would never see a block like this with part that was cleared out and part that wasn't cut yet. That's just not the way they did it. Dave's sort of a semi-hobbyist here and he just does it in a way that sort of seems to be fun and seems to make sense. But Taranzan is watching here and he probably, I guess, does his carving the way that his teacher, Asuka Sensei, tells him to do. So I would imagine Taranzan's doing it maybe in more the traditional way. You work over the whole thing with your knife first before starting any clearing. Unless Taranzan is cheating and doing it, you know, doing it for in a fun way as well. I don't know. We've talked about this before. Why do I do it this way? There is a reason. Because when you do just the lines without clearing anything, then when it comes time to grab your chisel, it's really, really easy to whack a line by mistake because you can't see the lines. Some of them are really, really faint and small. But because I do it this way, because I clear out some zones, then when it comes time to do the major clearing, I can see all the lines so clearly. So many times I cut away things that shouldn't have been cut away, you know. So I don't know, if Taran-san is still here, he was here earlier in the stream, if he's still here, Tanatsan, can you answer which way are you doing it? Are you doing it, yeah, never like this. So, Tanatsan, talk about what you're doing. Talk about Asuka-san's method and you know, what the deal is. 
you would cut the lines first with the small triangles popped out, I think, right? Please, don't know, jump in here. You mentioned something about this, the, the whys and, and stuff. You know. This really makes Dave look more like a hobbyist here. And I really, you know, I don't care. I'm not pretentious here. I'm not trying to look like an old, ancient, professional Japanese trained carver. But we've got Taran-san here, who is being trained that way, so then let's use the opportunity. Taran-san, jump in and tell us more about, uh, about the trad way to do this, and the whys and wherefores. One major reason for sure why the traditional carver wouldn't have done it the way I do it is for a speed. I put this knife down, I hunt around, grab another knife, think about it, get here, do this, rotate the block, do something else, go back and pick up the other knife. That's all wasted time. You know, doing work is work, that's okay, but when you do the tool switching and rotating the block, you are just absolutely wasting time and far and away, just keep one tool in your hand, go through until that tool is no longer needed, then switch to another tool. That's much, much more e efficient. And the old guys, remember, they're getting paid for the work by what they produce. There's no salaries back then. You're paid for the work you're done. So everybody wants to get as much done as possible. all it was time is money absolutely it was about time is money Taran-san's being trained to be an old carver you know what I mean you know what I mean. Yeah, here's got a real professional uses one tool till completion and then changes the tool. It's the most efficient way. This is absolutely it. So the thing is though, you know, I do get it done. I do get it done. And I get output. I'm actually a really when, when I do spend time doing it, and then not business management stuff, when I do spend time at my carving bench, I do get stuff done. You know. The other people working in our organization here, you know, John sounds a full-time carver for us, but I get more work done. So there's, there's more than one approach to this, you know, even though my way here is not the same, and when you go by the book, it's not as as uh, efficient as the traditional way, I get stuff done. Yeah, if I were working in a workshop together with a bunch of Meiji era carvers, you know, if we if we could imagine that transplant situation, there's a workroom, and a, a two or three Meiji era carvers there, and then Dave sitting at one side of the room, those guys would just laugh and laugh and laugh all day long at me because you know to them I would be the ultimate 
amateur just sitting there dabbling, fooling around with this. Now I'd get away with it because those guys are gone. I mean, they don't exist anymore. So I'm all we get here, so it's okay. What you get is what you've got. You know, you, you, what's the expression? You go to war with the soldiers you have available, you know, the, the tools you have available. And we get it done. And it's one reason why we're going to make this year, we're going to make 12 months of these prints. In the Meiji time, two or three guys, they would have done the whole year's work in a couple of weeks. This thing could have been produced. You see these, you know, the Yoshitoshi set of 36 beautiful women or something, and the publishing dates are all like within the span of six weeks, two months. And there, there's some workshop has published 36 massive Oban prints in a couple of months. It's because they had two or three or four carvers and they just sat down in the morning and blew through this stuff as fast, faster than you would believe. And nowadays we're just dabbling. Absolutely, we're just dabbling. But it would be fun one day to do a video like this. I <laughs> just to throw another idea on the table. Taransan's already frustrated with me because we have so many projects that will be fun to do but we're not doing, that would really, really, really be fun. Because my YouTube presence is so ubiquitous, because there's so much data out there watching Dave carve, the danger is that the future world will look at this as Dave went to Japan, learned from the masters, put it on YouTube, and here we are, we have a replica of the way it was done by the old ukiyo-e masters by looking at Dave's videos. And this is not the case. And I've tried over the years, I've tried as much as I can to explain and say, no, no, no. You know, there's stuff we're learning here. You can make prints and all that stuff, but do not take what I'm doing as a replication of how it was done in the old days. It's a bit of a paradox, you know. Excuse me a minute, I gotta go pay them. The mailman wants cash on delivery for this one. Just a minute. Going on, Did you see the package? It's like that big. I know what's inside. watanabe san turned up some interesting stuff a couple of weeks ago, and I was wondering when it was going to come, and finally today it came. This is something that's going to go in her flea market. She's really excited about it. Also, I want it because I don't have it, but 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 recently I've been winning too much, so see, it has to go to her. Yeah, the, the previous conversation, Taran-san needs to do more video himself, absolutely. Taran-san needs to do more video himself. There's no, there's no question of fighting or of Taran-san stepping on my territory, absolutely zero, zero, zero. Taran-san needs to have his own ton of video up there and explaining how he's got it passed down to him from the carver who got it passed down to him who got it down from the carver who got it passed down to him. We need more video. Yeah, there's tons of interesting videos that could, should, need to be made. Oh, I don't want to talk about this. I don't want to talk about this. Where are we? Yeah, that package. I'm not going to open it now because you know, it's not fair to what nabi -san. She is planning, whatever, just let's leave it. It's, it's big, there's two prints in there, and it is a rare and dynamite, dynamite item. And if you're interested, whatever, you are going to need 
you are going to need some green. That's not a cheap item whatsoever. We have lots of items in the flea market that are sort of reasonable, but every now and then a special one comes along and this would have... How's our time? I keep forgetting. How's our time? 9.07, a few more minutes to flea market, uh, to, to a few more minutes to show and tell. Show and tell today, I have a mixed bag. What I want to do is I'm going to recap. We opened some interesting stuff on Thursday, and it just flowed in front of my eyes so fast, I didn't really get what was going on. I've had a chance to look at this again, so I'm going to recap a little bit of the thing we opened on Thursday to bring you up to date on what we were actually looking at. Then we've got a recap. We've got the bath thing, some prints that we bathed, we put in the bath a few while ago, and then we also have some new stuff, and we have our black folder. We have no shortage of things to look at for today's show and tell. I don't know what to do about that. You know, videos with Taransa, it would be such a dynamite content. Absolutely dynamite. We have got to do that. He's trying to make a living, I'm trying to make a living. I don't know. It's not about the money, you know, like, we've got this wonderful support coming from Patreon, you know, we're, we're okay for money. At least this end we are, Taransa's private life, I don't know. It's not about finance, it's about trying to just get organized. Just need to get organized. I still know. I'm sort of, I'm behaving really badly here. I'm, I'm instead of grabbing hold of these problems and organizing my life. I've just been sort of sitting here waiting for, like waiting for something to happen, waiting for somebody to come and help me organize this or, or waiting for, I don't know. It's not like I didn't learn that lesson years ago. Nothing happens until you actually do it. If you just sit around thinking about what to do, nothing gets done. You've got to grab it. said that you know we are making progress you know, the last few days here in the shop you know Watanabe-san and Oku, Okumura-san who is now finding her sea legs she's been here a couple of months and those two ladies are really really starting to go to town they are really helping with the organization here they are taking over they have actually sort of almost totally revamped the way we do our shipping here Dave had been you know hanging around and footing around and not really grabbing this thing and they got tired of my procrastination. And the three of them, Aoyama-san and the two girls, they got busy with negotiating with all the different freight companies. They got the DHL guy here, they got the UPS, the FedEx guy, and they said, look, you've given us these price sheets that are all inconsistent, what's going on? Here's the company A, B, and C, show me what you've got. And those three guys, over the past couple of months, have pulled down dramatically the shipping costs for this company. They have heavily negotiated and played company A against played company B and said, look, here's what's going on. What are you screwing around with this like this for? And those companies have come back to the table and they've given new price sheets to us. And all across the board, our international shipping rates over the past few weeks have been dropping, dropping, dropping. EMS, we can't negotiate. That's post office. They put up their new high price and there's no negotiation because you can't talk to the post office. But the other three companies, their prices are rubber 
what are the word rubber? They are completely, totally, absolutely negotiable. And the stronger you are, the better price you get. And finally, we clued into this. Not me, but we, we clued into this. And you'll see this. This is reflected in, in the shipping on the, on the uh, shopping cart, which still looks expensive, but at least, oh my God, it's now, it's getting, getting manageable. They've been sending some packages to DHL, like a great wave print. They've been sending it to Europe for like $30. It's grossly expensive compared to what it used to be, but my God, it's manageable now. $150 print to send to the other side of the world for $30. It's 20% of the cost. This is the new paradigm. Before for us, that was inconceivable, but that's the new paradigm. But it's happening and it's shipping and it's getting there and things are moving. Anyway, anyway, anyway. The thing about this is all those changes that are happening in the shipping routines, you know, it's easy to say this, but uh, we've shipped, we've switched now a whole bunch of our shipping over from EMS, and we now use DHL, sort of a package like that, a great wave print going to Europe as an example. That's all very well, but over the past year, we had built a complete software system that integrated completely with the post office software. I, they have a thing called an API setup, you know, where your own software can communicate with the post office software, and our, the customer goes to the shopping cart, buys something, goes to PayPal, pays for it. This all happens while we're sleeping. Our software then clues into the post office software gets the tracking number, prepares the package label, all that kind of stuff. So our, our clerk, Okamura-san, comes to the, our, our own manager page, and there it is. The, the, sh the shipping labels have already been prepared. And we had this ready for the post office. So now, of course, I get back from Canada a while ago, and this is all set up for DHL, and Okamura-san comes to me and says, Dave, we're using DHL more, and I say, that's great. And she says, well, I'm typing all the names and addresses in by hand. I want something. So Dave has to go back to the back to the drawing board on our manager system here and I had to build a way to tie in the DHL's computer system which is of course doable Amazon and stuff they do this all the time now the Mokohantan is doing it our computer system talks to the DHL system does all the things it needs to tell them and the shipping labels come up out of Okamura-san's uh, printer but we had to write the damn software to do that. Anyway, enough, 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 enough. Let's look at some prints. Did you see also, while I was ranting there, I broke the knife? <laughs> the tip is gone. The very tip, not so much. You can see it, it's no longer a point. Got it? Just while I was too busy complaining about software, I got uh, Karma jumped in and said, Dave, shut up, stop complaining, and broke the tip of the knife. <laughs> it's so cute. <laughs> Let's look at some stuff. It is going to be, it's going to be quite a weekend here. Okay, a few things, a few things, a few things. <laughs> you remember, you remember that what we looked at a few, a few, was it last week? We got a set of prints. The ones, we found these on Yahoo Auction. They came in to us. These were the original packages of the subscription. Yeah, the tip did come out of the block. Tom, thank you for the tip. Don't worry about it. It just blew away. It was so small, it just blew away. <laughs> Note to self, don't complain about software while carving. Don't get in a bad mood while carving. That's the key. Okay, we saw this a few weeks ago. It was uh, a bunch of Meiji era or early Taisho era subscription prints. They were Tokaido era woodblock prints that it seems we now learn from all this paperwork that were sent to people by subscription. And every time period, every week or two weeks or whatever it was, they would get two of the prints which were laminated to postcards and people could use them as postcards or they could collect them. We saw this a couple of weeks ago. I also realized and had known about this that the, the woodblock prints were laminated to a cardboard not quite so strongly. And I promised at the time I would get up there into the hot bath upstairs and do what I could about taking some off. And we did, not we did, I did. 
Here's the first one. And I didn't have to do it in the bath. I went to the sink where I brush my teeth every evening. And I just put some hot water in the sink, some warm water in the sink. I put two of the prints. I just slipped them straight into the hot water. And I stood back. And I tell you, not, not one minute later, the prints floated off the postcards. The postcards are here, and look at this. There's no glue residue, there's nothing, and the two prints literally floated, floated off the backing paper. I didn't have to work, I didn't have to peel, I didn't have to separate, I had no risk of the prints getting damaged whatsoever. Both sheets, the washi sheet and the cardboard sheet, were water resistant enough that they didn't break down. They floated apart. And now you can see there's people that don't think these are woodblock prints, you know. The guy who sold it to us on Yahoo Auction, he said it's not a woodblock print because you can see on the back there's no barren marks, it's on a card. It just looks like printing. And he thought it was printing. That's why we got it so cheap. It's not. It's a woodblock print. And we knew this. You can see it from the front, the carving. It's a woodblock print on thin, thin, thin washi. And if you get in the light right, you can see the barren marks, you can see the pigment coming through to the back. It's beautifully strong washi. But when they're on card, there's two things that are a problem. One is you can't see the beauty of the print because it's stuck to a card. And second is usually, maybe not so much in this case, but usually the cardstock is crummy pulp cardstock and it goes brown quickly and turns the prints brown. So it's really important, if you can, to get the prints off these cards for long-term preservation. Leaving it on bad cardstock and you're looking at 100 years, get it off this thing, this washi will last for many hundreds of years. So we kind of owe it to the next generation of people who can enjoy these prints to get them off this backing wherever we can. Having said that, I have no time to do this. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> anyway, there it is. I just wanted to clarify that that could be done. There are still, I get emails from people, Dave, you're misunderstanding. Those are not woodblock prints. Those are Meiji examples of early lithograph printing. No, they are not. They are actual, real, normal woodblock prints pasted on the card. Okay, away you go. That's one. The other one, the little tiny book we got in last Thursday's show and tell, which dumped on my desk. I opened it and I said, hmm, I'm not sure if this is woodblock print or not. It isn't woodblock printing. We've learned a bit more, but we've learned a little bit more about it. A couple of things. First, let's get a date. Where is John when you need him? Doesn't matter. We can figure this out by ourselves. Let's go to the back page, which I should have done the other day, and we have a date on here. It is Meiji 14, quite early on. Somebody got a date for me? I don't know what this is. What's Meiji 14? 1880s, I guess. And look what we have at the back of the book. I didn't even turn the pages far enough to see this. What have we here. How Japanese does this look to you? Not very. This is one of those design books. Books you saw at the beginning. It's mostly birds and flowers up at the beginning of the book. Then it changes into, well, it's birds and flowers almost all the way through. And at the end of it, there's a bit of landscape and there's a bit of just design work. And look at this. How Japanese does this look? Not at all. These are whatever. They're, they're like imitations of European Baroque and Renaissance ornamentation and stuff. And they are not woodblock in any way whatsoever. What you're looking at is metal engraving. It could have been copper. It could have been steel. I don't know. Somebody got a plate, put a design on, and they used a bureau. Not a knife like we have, they use a buron to incise lines in the plate. It's then wiped with ink and printed. So it's a sort of, it's an engraving. It's a wood engraving. It's not an etching. It's not a woodblock print. 
and I can see for sure if there was any 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 doubt about it how can I tell this is engraved and not cut as a woodblock print you see it in places like this these over lines. When it's a woodblock print, you have to make it by leaving the black lines and cutting out the squares. If it's an engraving, you do it by soup, 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 scraping the lines into your metal plate. So in the case of a woodblock print, it's inevitable that here and there, there is a tiny pop out. And if there was a woodblock print, you'd see something like down here, maybe or over here or somewhere, there would be a pop out where a piece of wood has popped out. But when it's engraving, you see the other way. You see places where the line has gone a little bit too far. Look, one of these fishy lines here has come out and it's come too far. Now, if this were a woodblock print, this is impossible, but this is a clear sign that this is wood engraved. But not wood engraved, it's engraved, wood and or metal. It could have been engraved on wood. These, I think, almost certainly are metal plates. And it's that era in Japan when they were trying all this new stuff. They had seen European technologies and they were bringing it in and trying to learn how to use it. One thing I'm really curious about, this is 1881, early days for engraving of this type in Japan really early days and yet this stuff is magnificently beautifully done and what I would have expected to see is if you look back to the earlier days of Japan European uh, interactions I would have expected to see engravings published in Japan where guys who were sort of clearly trying to figure out how to do this and maybe that is what happened this is 1881 so this is now 30 years it's a generation after the intercourse started so maybe we're looking at now a generation of people who have been practicing this and getting good at it but I don't know I don't know was this done by Westerners did they send these to London to get engraved bring back the plates were Western engravers working in Japan at that time or is this Japanese people who have just now learned to do this to a very, very, very high class level? I don't know. I have no knowledge of this. It's outside my, my experience completely. But there it is. Examples of early metal engraving. You can see, once you know what it is, you can see it everywhere. The stippling is metal engraving. Chop, 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 chop. The biran stipples this thing rather than leftover pieces of wood. There we have it, 1881, the little book. It cost me, what did it cost me? I don't know if I popped up the auction. Hang on a second, let's get to the auction listing. What did I pay for this? What did I pay? Oh! Here's the auction for those of you who can uh, see it. A lot of people can't see. Uh, I can't get to it. It's just a second. Sorry, 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 sorry. Dave, just a second. Sorry, sorry. Here we go. There's the auction listing here in Japan. The guy had three of them up. He had one, two, three. The first two went quite expensive, and the third one was the one I picked up, just like this. So it'll go in our collection. As I said, it's not woodblock printing but it'll go in our collection as a good example to show and demonstrate similar work that was done not with woodblock printmaking. Okay, let's move along, move along. What's our time, 26, let's open something. We have another package, you know what's in here already. I've told you this, we've seen this, like every few days we see one of these. Some guy, some dealer in junk, it's not a, not a print dealer, not a book dealer, it's a junk dealer. He got a hold of one of the old books of match labels and he tore it up page by page by page and he's selling them on Yahoo Auctions one page at a time. You saw a selection of this last week and you've got this week's selection now. And he had a bunch up last night that went way too expensive. More people, I guess, from the financial point of view, he's done the right thing to maximize his revenue from this book. 
But the downside is he's destroyed an old book, and people like me complain because we can't easily get a whole bunch of match level prints all at once. But then we're definitely seeing price inflation. And part of it could be, actually, maybe there's people who've been watching these streams or are looking out for these things and bidding them up. I don't know. No idea. No idea. So here's today's selection. Let's flip through and have a look at what we've got. Some of them went so expensive. The ones last night, you can't make a break. It's like a set of nine match label prints. And it went up to like $60. And it's not even something super special. It's just another normal set of nine match label prints. $60. That's coming from the guy who was selling his series this year at $55 for five prints. So I guess it's okay. I don't know. I don't know what they're worth. I don't know. Let's take a quick look at some of this. Remember we had one of these last week? We had, it was Mizu Tsukushi, a collection of, of objects with the same theme of Mizu. And I couldn't read the Mizu. And Ran Gaksha here jumped in and read it for me. Before Ran Gaksha jumps in and can say, I can actually read this one this time. It's Otsu. Otsu e Shu. Shu is collection, E is picture. Otsu is a place name. It's one of the old stations on the Tokaido. It's the last station before you get to Kyoto. And there was a tradition there going back centuries, long before woodblock printmaking. There was a s tradition there of, of household shops making pictures, votive kind of pictures that would sell to travelers. Here, buy a good luck charm. Give me five pennies and you get a good luck charm. And they were called Otsu E. There used to be a feeling that they were the progenitors of ukiyo-e. That theory has been blown out of the water many, 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 many years ago. The fact that they were on the Tokaido is no connection. So what we have here is somebody has made a match label set based on Otsu-e. And we have a date here. We have a date of Showa 6, September of Showa 6. Showa 6 would be... 1931, I can do that easily, because I'm Showa 26, which is 1951, so Showa 6 would be 1931. And these are all very much classical, traditional subjects. Otsue had a very limited, uh, what's the word, a limited, uh, not palette, a limited uh, iconography. There was only a certain number of pictures. This one, this is classical, classical Otsu-e. And the style we see here today also is uh, very similar. If you just saw this anywhere, anybody who knows Japanese uh, art history in any way whatsoever, they would look at this and recognize this as being Otsu-e. So the group of collectors who called for this series to be made in 1931, they called for the designer to make some Otsu-e, they put their money on the table, and they got back a set of 200 or so woodblock prints. They're not really all that beautifully made. They're a bit rough, but that goes in keeping with the character of Otsu-e, which were not careful stuff whatsoever. They were slapdash. You know the deal, you go to Hawaii now and you're in the shopping mall and you see a guy with a spray can and he makes these spray pictures for the tourists and the tourist buys this picture that was made in front of him. Just, you know, it's a deal. All over the world we have these. Some are spray cans, some are this, some are that. There are street artists who make a certain kind of picture while you wait. Otsu-e were this kind of stuff. They weren't all made while you wait. You'd go, in the, you'd go in the shop off the Tokaido Road, there'd be all kinds of stuff hanging up. But right there in front of you, choo 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 bang bang bang, color color color, choo 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 bang bang bang, color color color. Surely they would have been made right there while the people are watching. I said rough, I mean rough in the sense of not refined. This next series is totally different. These are very, very, very carefully planned and controlled and refined. You know the theme here before I tell you, the theme is the chief kujin the seven lucky gods. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six, five, seven, seven. we have 14, but I think we have two versions of each person. Yeah, we have two versions of each person. And if you're not gonna ask me to give you the name of the seven lucky gods, I cannot do that. I can identify only two of them. I can identify Ebisu, this gentleman, and Daikoku, this gentleman. I don't remember the other ones at all, I'm sorry. But this is a double match label set of the seven lucky gods 
done in two colors each. This is really quite interesting. Why do we have two colors for each one? Were they test prints? I don't know. I wonder if this was tests. Maybe a set of tests going back to the sponsors. Choose the color. Let me know which version you want, A or B. It's quite possible, you know. I don't know. I don't have any documentation on this. Ben 10, have we got it? That's one I should have remembered. Ben 10. Sleepy, happy, doc. <laughs> as far as date, these will date to the same era. They have every appearance of being very similar to the ones we just looked at. So I was asking about my accent. What can I say? It's a bit of a melange, you know. First five years was London. I was born in Yorkshire, but the first five years was London. The next uh, 10 years was the Canadian Prairies. The next 10 years was Vancouver, West Coast, Canada. And then the last 35 years have been Japan. So you tell me, what's my accent? I don't have an accent. These are nice prints. These are quite carefully made. And given that we are still not finished this year's series, we are still looking for themes for more prints from this year's series, I wonder if perhaps we might see some of these people again. I don't know. It's quite possible. Anyway, very nicely done. Very nicely done. I'm sorry to have so many match labels in recent times, but that's, uh, that's just the way the, the, the thing's been turning. Match labels today, we got that huge package delivered to us a few minutes ago by the post office. Lots of different styles of things going here. Okay, 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 okay. I think I had better be out of here. Someone's asking, what's the, the upper left? This is a person's name. The match label prints like this, the people who are in the collector's group, they put their money in and they got their names on this. And this is Kubo. This would be Kub Kubo, would be one of the sponsors here. How much of the rest of these can I read? This is awfully small type. Is that Yamashita? I can't read it. I can't see it. Just a minute. It's the sponsor's names. Yes, that's Yamashita. We have here Hanatefu, this would be not his actual name, this is going to be, that's Yamashita again. So it would be their handle name in the group. He's got Hanatefu. Hanatefu. So it's the person's name. Once they're, once they're passing all the prints out, everybody knows what's going. Yeah, it's Yamashita. It's Yamashita done in the style of like a, a Chinese I don't know, income. Okay, there we go. All right, thanks very much, gang. I am going to get out of here. I am going to go back to that block now for the rest of today. I'm also going to take some raw footage of carving this block ready for an upcoming YouTube video. Okay, here we are. I'll be back again now. Uh, two more days, Monday morning for me, Sunday evening for most of you. And I'll be, by then, I'll be working on the second of the blocks for that print set. Thank you very much. I guess first thing I got to do though is get a cup of coffee, go outside and clean up a little bit. There's a bit of garbage out there for the, from leftover from last night and I should clean it up before the street gets too busy. Sky tree's gone again too. Oh, it's there in the background. Can you see the sky tree? Right where the kid is walking on the roof over there. Okay, I'm out of here. See you next time. Thanks very much. Bye for now. <laughs> See you soon.